Thank you, sir. Appreciate that. All right. Okay. Well, th thank you, Raj, uh, very much for the for the invitation to come speak here today. I really found the, the time I was able to spend uh, an hour or so prior to this really interesting. And I hope uh, that you all will uh, find what I have to share today uh, of some value to you. So I'm going to take about 15 minutes uh, to describe the last 10 years at my company, DTE Energy, and, and then I'll take a little time to reflect on some of the lessons that I personally have learned uh, going through that decade. So just a little background on, on DTE. Uh, we're about a 50 billion market cap company, about a 25 billion equity market cap. Uh, we serve three and a half million customers in Michigan, so much of the energy in Michigan flows through us. That's about 70% of our company, and the other 30 is in energy businesses in, the, in about 25 other states. So we're in the energy business. And I'd say, um, a little over a decade ago, in mid-2007, um, DTE was a thoroughly mediocre company, and maybe worse. Uh, the, the measurables told the story. So our employee safety, bottom quartiles consistently in our industry. Our customer satisfaction, same thing, near the bottom of the JD Power charts in our Midwest peers. There'd be 17 peers. We were always 16 or 17. Costs benchmarked poorly. Total shareholder return consistently in the bottom quartile. Our long-term equity uh, plans never paid out. But perhaps most conspicuously uh, was our people's energy. Uh, our engagement, which was measured by Gallup, always was bottom quartile, and the half of our company that was unionized was worse. Remember the day when the union engagement came back in the ninth percentile, the bottom 9% of, of employees worldwide, and I thought nothing, nothing good can come from that. In mid-2007, I told my top leaders that I concluded that the root cause of all of this was a deeply, deeply broken culture at our company, and it was our job to fix that culture. But I've got to be honest with you, I had no idea how to do that. I remember going out to meet with culture experts just to get a sense for what I was even really talking about. At the same time, uh, I began to study continuous improvement seriously for the first time. I'd known about it forever, but I was studying it hard because our productivity was so poor. And in the process, I learned a core continuous improvement principle from my Toyota instructor, senior person at Toyota. And the principle was, at the core of continuous improvement is a deep respect for human dignity. I remember the first time he said this, as a guy supposed to be teaching me about productivity, I, I really did not get it. Uh, but as I thought about it more, I guess you could put it differently. If you're going to ask for the best energy and creativity and thinking from your people, if you want them to be the best for you, then you need to stand for the best in their futures. That's only fair. That's a fair exchange. Or if you want to put the exchange more crudely, you can ask for their best energy, creativity, and problem solving, and then say, thanks a lot for the productivity. By the way, we really don't need you anymore, so you're expendable. So with that on my mind, um, I entered 2008 and began the decade that really fundamentally reshaped my understanding of what it meant to lead. You know, we worked our way through 2008 pretty normally until the stilts under the world economy started to wobble. I remember taking note of that, and then they fell out altogether. The economy collapsed, and at the very epicenter of the collapse was Detroit, Michigan, my headquarters city. Raj is right. 
people quickly concluded DTE would be thrown in the scrap heap of mediocre Michigan companies. There'll be a junk bond utility. They are in deep trouble. I remember pulling my uh, leadership team together just prior to Thanksgiving in 2008 and saying to them, everything that we've worked on this year is scrap. We just got hit by a tsunami. I don't know how big it is, but it's big. So go home and enjoy Thanksgiving. And then we're gonna come back and we got about 10 days to put together a completely new plan. So we did that. Uh, the team came back from Thanksgiving and we decided the first thing we gotta do is size this problem. And we sized it roughly at 150 to $200 million of margin, not revenue, that had, was taking wings and flying away from the company. That would have made us a junk bond utility, no doubt about it. So we all bonded and said, we can't let that happen to this company. And so we've got to go find 150 to $200 million of margin to keep the health of our company together. Two days later, uh, my president and my most senior HR professional came back to me and said, numbers are clear. There's no way to do this. Too much cost involved in our people. We've got to do a big layoff, probably 20% of the workforce. Now, I thought of that in light of the continuous improvement principle, the dignity of people. And I realized if I had any hope for the rest of my time at DT in anybody believing in that, I was about to make the decision that defined my career. Because if I walked away from our people at their time of greatest crisis, they would remember that for many, many years. So now I thought about it deeply. And then we came back together as a team uh, and we locked arms around doing the opposite. So at the end of 2008, just before Christmas, I taped a video. It's pretty crude actually, but people listened to it very carefully. And the video said, um, look, we can't promise you anything, but we will make this promise. The last lever we will pull to keep our company healthy is a layoff. You can depend on that. We need a commitment in return. We need you to bring every ounce of energy and creativity and focus that you can possibly muster to keeping our company healthy. And if all 10,000 of us bring that, we just might have a chance of getting through this okay. That was the plan. We of course did more of the normal planning, but there really wasn't a way to make the numbers foot. I remember telling my wife in uh, right, right around Christmas that uh, I really hope this works. I remember going into 2009 with kind of a pit in my stomach, holding my breath. Well, <laughs> uh, 2009 was an amazing year. I met a lot with my controller, as you can imagine, my controller, Peter Alexei. Peter came to me after January. Hey, Jerry, hey, we beat our budget numbers in January. Yes, you know, GM is veering toward bankruptcy. February, we beat our budget. I was puzzled. March, first quarter close, we beat our numbers. First time I said to Peter, Peter, I think there's a break in our financial close model. You, be you better find it. So it doesn't make sense. April, May, beat budget, beat budget. Close the first half out. We beat the budget in all six months. And I said to Peter again, Peter, check the financial close model. July, beat budget. August, I'm on the beach in Michigan, and it's cold. I'm in a sweatshirt. We sell air conditioning. I said, this is the month we get creamed. Peter came back in early September and said, we beat the budget in August. And I slammed my fist on the table and said, Peter, your model is broken. Find it. And he slammed his fist on the table back and said, there's nothing wrong with the model. Jerry, this is just what's happening. And it was maybe the first time I really believed it. I had been fighting my intuition that the numbers must be wrong. And so then I went to look for it. 
And what I found was, in fact, hundreds, thousands, really, of discretionary acts by employees making good on their half of the bargain. As the year went on, we brought the financial community into Detroit because we wanted, wanted them to know we weren't dying there. We increased our guidance by 15%. We had the strongest cash flow year in our company's history to that point in 2009 at the epicenter of the financial crisis. It made no sense to me. I told my board in my self-assessment at the end of 2009, I have learned far more this year than in any year of my career. And everything that I learned was about people and what they're capable of when they really want something or believe in something. Well, we entered 2010 and I found myself asking, how do we sustain this sort of energy as the crisis fades? I really didn't want 2009 to be our proudest year. We'd excelled in 2009, but look, we were still in the, in the heart of a crisis. And we were a long way from being a great company. And in early 2010, um, I held a breakfast for about a dozen employees. I do that once a month, employees from various levels. And after the breakfast, there was a woman who was sort of standing off in the corner, and I could tell she was waiting to talk. And so after the other uh, attendees had left, I walked over and we chit-chatted a bit, and then I asked, is there something you wanted to talk about? And she said, well, I never had a chance to properly thank you for last year. I said, well, what do you mean? She said, well, my husband works in the auto industry. He was laid off immediately. We have three young children. I was deathly afraid of what would happen to our family if I were laid off too. And when you said the last lever that we would pull is a layoff, and if we all bonded together, we might get through this, it gave me hope. And so I wanted to thank you for that. And I, obviously, I was very moved listening to her. But then she pivoted and said, but Jerry, uh, the people around us aren't OK. I still know so many people who are laid off. Our communities are broken. We're getting healthier, but what can we do to help all of them? I remember looking at her and thinking, she just put her finger on it. Our people's energy is turning out now. They want to help other people. This offered us the opportunity to move from energy from crisis to energy from aspiration, energy from helping ourselves to energy from helping others. And so I began to talk about DT's role in fixing Detroit, in bringing vibrancy back to Michigan. And I went to group after group of employees and said, you want to help your neighbors? You want to help your brothers and sisters or your community? Make our company better. We're the biggest investor in the state by far every year. Use our economic might to stand the state back up. Everybody pays our bills. Be better. Take the burden off them. And it resonated. People bought it. You remember, we're still in the middle of a crisis. It really worked. Our people were hungry uh, to help their friends. And uh, the energy level within the company rose further. Our engagement measures, those pitiful engagement measures, began to move. I had another formative experience. It was a year later, in early 2011. I traveled to Texas uh, to see Joe Robles. Joe Robles was a board member. He was also the CEO of USAA. USA, the company that serves members of the military and their families, a really well-run company, particularly good at customer service. We were there to benchmark uh, customer service operations, in particular call centers. We met in Joe's office and chit-chatted a little bit, uh, and then we walked out into his call center, and Joe was pointing out the particulars. But all I could focus on was the positivity of his people, the positive energy, the smiles on their faces, the welcome to Texas, Mr. Anderson greetings that I got from everybody. There was just a, an energy in the room that was palpable. And we, we got back to his office. He was ready to dive into uh, the benchmarking exercise. And I said, Joe, wait a minute. 
how did you produce that? And he said, produce what? I said, the, the positive energy of your people, Joe, it was everywhere. He kind of shoved the papers aside and he said, look, Jerry, the first job of every leader is to connect their people to purpose. He said, and that's kind of a military, I think it's military background. Joe is from military background. Everybody needs to know the military mission. Well, he brought it to life in a corporation. But he said to me, that job you just looked at, that's a tough job. On the phone all day, person on the other end of the phone might be impatient, rude. But they also might be really important. My job is to keep reminding my employees who might be at the other end of the phone. They might be deployed today. They might have served this country in some amazing way in the past. And they deserve our best. And I need to keep reminding them of that. And then he brought out videos that were his way of communicating this message to his people. And they were emotionally charged. I, I mean, I had tears in my eyes watching them. I didn't work for the place. And I remember the plane ride home that night with my team, and I said, uh, what we do in producing energy and the way we produce it is vitally important to the world. We ought to be able to do what he's done. So we went back to DT. We spent time working on our own expression of purpose. Then I asked our communita communications team to put together our own purpose video, like I'd seen at USAA. Now, I have to tell you, in the process, I questioned myself over and over, whether our people were going to find this really cool or really hokey. Like, you know, the kind of, oh, Jerry, when it came out. To the very end, I was second guessing myself. And we, I took it into a room like this of our top 200 leaders. They dimmed the lights and showed the video. And I was wondering. When the lights came back up. There was a moment of silence and then just an eruptive standing ovation from our leaders. We did it a couple days later in our town square with several thousand people there, the same result. We then started to send it out to power plants and service centers with employees who were grizzled veterans of 20, 30, 40 years. And I started to get word back of people with tears in their eyes at the end of this thing. And you know what? It was just some words that expressed the importance of what we do, set to pictures of employees and music. That's all it was. But somehow it spoke to them that what they gave eight or 10 hours a day to every day was important. And our people really wanted to know that what they were giving all that time to uh, really mattered. Well, as we focused on this work of culture and mindset and purpose, our measurables, uh, the hard side measurables, measurables began to move in our favor. All of them did, in fact. In the spring of 2012, um, just five years after I told our leaders that our culture is deeply broken, we won our first Gallup Great Workplace Award. Gallup uh, reserves that for the top 10% of companies in their database globally. So we'd gone from way down the list into the top 10%. I could, uh, I could feel the difference by then. I could, it began to feel like what I experienced at Joe Robles' operation. The energy was palpably different uh, from what it had been five years earlier. Some of our most interesting work was with our unions. So I think you know Detroit was sort of the birthplace of the union movement. <clears throat> Recall they started in the ninth percentile. I remember a uh, pivotal meeting with our union leaders, where actually I was there to talk about purpose. And the meeting became so divisive, needlessly, that I, I got angry. And I, I told my HR lead, I'm, gonna, I'm leaving. I'm not, I'm not going to do what I said I was going to do. And he said, you can't do that. So I went up to the front of the room and I said, I can't believe what I just witnessed. I don't know what we're doing here anyway. I said, you know, the low engagement scores of your members are an indictment of me. But they're an indictment of you too. And we ought to work on fixing it together. Well, we spent the rest of the meeting talking about that. And they did. They worked on it with us. And by 2014, a couple of years later, our union employees had moved from 9th percentile in 2007 to 90th 
percentile in Gallup's database. The, yeah. And again, the difference of what it felt like to interact with our union employees went from painful uh, to enjoyable. And of course, the change in work that comes with that is a big deal. So what did all of this work yield? Well, by 2018, um, the thoroughly mediocre company of a decade earlier was in a pretty different place. Uh, our engagement by 2018 was in the top 3% of Gallup's universe. Um, we'd won seven consecutive Gallup Great Workplace Awards, so we were one of 10 companies in their multi-decadal history of tracking engagement that had won seven in a row. Our safety in 2018 was the best in our industry. The National Safety Council put our safety culture in the top 2% of all industry uh, in the United States, so the mindset of our people was right. Our customer satisfaction that was always at the bottom now was always in the top one or two of our Midwest peer set of 16 or 17 companies. And our total shareholder return for the period that I just described, at that decade of sort of figuring things out, our total shareholder return was 275%, and the average of our peers was 83. So we were three and a half X from a hard shareholder return standpoint, what our peers were on average. So our focus on people and purpose and service and community had dramatically improved our company's results. So what had I learned from all of this and this journey? Well, I have six thoughts I'd like to share with you. First, the fountainhead priority at every company is maximizing the available human energy. Maximizing human energy or maximizing discretionary energy, as a lot of people call it. Everything else that a company is contingent on that. You don't have great energy, you will never be a great company. It's just common sense. So that's job one. Second, people give their discretionary energy to what they believe in or admire or love. So your job is to make your company worthy of that energy, to make it a place that people admire and respect and love. And if you don't, well, that discretionary energy will go elsewhere. Not to you, they'll put it somewhere their children, their church, their nonprofit, but not your company. But if you do, if you make your company deserving of that energy, of their best energy, it's absolutely magical and transformational. That's what I learned. That is the thing that transforms a company. Third, the surest way to do this, the surest way to earn that energy is to tie your company visibly and tangibly to the service of other people. Most people are drawn to helping and serving others. I think it's, for most of us, it's in our nature. We wanna do that. And they will give their best energy to a company that stands for it. And they will give that energy to our companies if we can show them that serving others in one way or another is what we're about at the core of the work we do. But we have, to, we have to help them understand why that is and how that is. And through all of this, I've come to a different understanding of what a company is in the end. I now view a company as nothing more than a place where people come together to combine their collective energy and put it at the service of other people, to do something important and worthwhile for other people. Just a energy collection point of people serving other people. Fourth, our job as a CEO is to stand for all of that unwaveringly. So if drawing human energy, discretionary energy is so critical, and if we earn it by making our company a place that people love and admire and a place that stands for serving others, then job one for a CEO is to relentlessly stand for that, to relentlessly champion that. And Raj is right when he says, he said it at my company when he visited, that the consciousness of an organization will not rise above the consciousness of its most senior leader. I think that's true. 
that you, you as senior leaders of your company can either elevate or cap the consciousness of the organization. So our job is to work on ourselves first, to elevate ourselves, to expand our own understanding, and to spread it to our people. Fifth, this work requires courage. The allure of the hard side of business will be a constant siren song chirping at you. It tries to pull you away from the sort of work that I was describing. As Raj said, I was raised on the hard side. That's how I was brought up. I studied engineering and physics and practiced that for a while. Went back to school in economics and finance. Went on to work for quite a while at McKinsey, which is problem solving strategy, deal analytics. Um, that was my understanding of what business was. And I had a constant voice in my head, even when I knew better, even when I'd seen all the evidence to the contrary, I had a constant voice in my head saying, you should be focused on strategy. You should be doing a deal. You should be focused on operations or finance. And that voice is wrong, but it's going to be there. We're just so much wiring has been built. Those pathways don't go away. You just have to quiet them down. And if you don't maintain your conviction, um, no one else will. They'll follow your lead. So your job is to stand steadfastly for this stuff. And then sixth and finally, I think Raj's use of the word healing and the healing organization is exactly right. Now, I have to admit that the, I heard from the executive at our company that Raj was writing a book called The Healing Organization, and my first reaction was, wow, that's a little strong. Is that a little bit much? <laughs> and then I, uh, after some thought, I, I realized, no, he's, he's right. You know, our society has so many ills that need to be cured. So many ills that need to be healed. And if we're waiting for the government or nonprofits to provide the cure, that is going to be a really long wait. They certainly have a role to play, an important role to play, uh, but the problems are way too big for them to solve alone. You know, in this country, so much power and energy and capability resides in the private sector. So if our society's ills are going to be addressed, uh, we have to see it as our business to be in the middle of addressing the problems, to be in the middle of the healing, as Raj calls it, or those problems will stay there. But looping all the way back uh, to that first fountainhead priority, maximizing the available human energy, and drawing people's discretionary energy, there's no better path to that energy, no better way to deserve it and make it available to our companies than to be, be part of the healing process for the people in the communities around us. People love that when a company is part of it. And so the best path to that energy really is uh, by becoming a healing organization. So I hope my uh, remarks um, were of some help today. And uh, thank you very much for taking some time to listen. Appreciate it. Thank you.